Well, good morning. Wednesday morning, and we have arrived finally to the end of 1 Samuel, uh, chapters 30 and 31. Of course, a good thing to be reminded as we come to this reading is that 1 Samuel is, um, well, about to lead into 2 Samuel. And in one sense, this story as it finishes doesn't really finish here, but it comes to a fitting and sad and tragic end, as we'll see. And first of all, we see that in chapter 30, where you see David in uh, another dark and terrible situation. In fact, this last chapter that involves David, chapter 30, has a picture of devastation that ultimately leads to deliverance. Um, but But it's hard to imagine a situation getting worse than David has already been faced with. And yet that's exactly what we see in chapter 30. And then in chapter 31, are the sad and terrible demise of King Saul. But more of that in a moment. Just for a moment, think about that pattern that we see here moving from um, devastation to deliverance. Uh, D- David uh, and his men uh, come ultimately to Ziglag. We- we've been informed already by the text that there's been a raiding party of Amalekites and they have come and devastated um, Ziglag. Now, remember, this is the place, uh, the Philistine city that's been caring for David and in fact where he's been living and caught up in that destruction is his family and the family of all of those people that are with David. And so it is a catastrophe. And when they come into that situation, you see the picture an incredible picture of grief that takes hold. Uh, verse four: So David and his men wept aloud until they had no left; they had no strength left to weep. And we discover then immediately that both of David's wives have been taken, and uh, the men of um, David's company start to turn on him and are thinking about stoning David. And it looks like it couldn't get any worse. And at that point, what will David do in response? And I think that's an interesting little picture in the middle of all of this, is that that place of grief moves ultimately and pretty swiftly here to a place of strength. You notice at the end of verse 6, it says, But David found strength in the Lord his God. Um, personal note of his God. It's not the God that's out there. It's his God. And that is the place where he finds strength. doesn't stop him from grieving. doesn't stop the tragedy that is surrounding him. But where will he place his trust and where will he get comfort from and strength? From the Lord, who is his God. Well, will the Lord, his God, uh, come through for him? And what we discover next is the very thing that we haven't seen in the life of Saul. That is, once again, David reaches out to inquire of God and to listen to God's word. So he speaks to the priest, he brings the ephod, and he inquires of the Lord whether or not they should go and pursue the party that has wreaked havoc in Ziglag. And what they discover is the answer is yes, go. And so they set off 600 people. The number is quickly dropped to 400 because 200 are exhausted. And then just by chance, in the middle of all of that, they find an Egyptian who's hungry and thirsty in the middle of a field. And he himself will be the providential link that will allow them to discover where this raiding party has disappeared to. Because otherwise, how will David be able to have success chasing down these bandits that have disappeared into the wilderness? Well, this man, um, through, it's not good luck, it's not good fortune. This is the providence of God in the midst of their suffering. Here Here is how David will find the Lord his God to be his strength. The Egyptian that they find is able to direct uh, David and his men and the 400 of them come upon the Amalekites while they are feasting and drinking and reveling because of all the plunder that they've taken and they are fought. It's a very successful battle. There are some that escape. David, we're told, verse 18, recovers everything that the Amalekites have taken, including his wives. Nothing is missing, not young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else that they have taken. David brought everything back. It's a picture of great success, a picture of the God who comes through in the midst of the grief and the devastation. Here is the deliverance that takes place. And David is able to restore everything back. It's a a picture of what the kingdom of God, in a way, kind of looks like under God's king as uh, as he will soon, um, as he soon will be. But notice also the nature of uh, this king uh, and how unlike David is to Saul. 
so that when he comes back, the 200 that were too exhausted to go and fight, there are evil people, um, whingers perhaps, troublemakers in, uh, in David's camp. And they say, they didn't go with us. They shouldn't get any plunder. But David says, well, that's not right or fair or gracious or generous. In fact, everyone should get the same. All should share alike. Now, following that, David then, interestingly, he then sends some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends. And when you hear that, you think, well, there's something probably pretty fair in that, right? Because it's probably the stuff that the Amalekites stole from them as they marauded their towns. But it's also generous that David would take the spoils of war and give it out to those people who had suffered. But it's also really strategic because it will kind of win friends and influence people, as we'll see when we move into the next saga, into 2 Samuel. But in all of that, we then turn from this place that went from devastation to deliverance to another picture of devastation, because now we're taken back to another battlefield. It's where the Philistines have come against Israel. And in this case, it is the sad end. But of course, this sad end has been the very end that Yahweh had promised would come to Saul. We saw that back in chapter 28, verse 19, chapter 15, verse 28. And Saul on this occasion will fall. But what's interesting in that is that because this is the nature of God's promised word to him, we realize that God's word won't fail. And in the same way that Saul was promised this devastation to come to him and his kingdom taken from him, it's to be given to another. So if that promise has been kept, then this promise to give the kingdom to another will stand as well. And that's a comfort right on the eve of uh, these two books, because we know that the promise was to come that David would be the king. And so we have this terrible, sad picture of the destruction of Saul at his own hand. And when you read through this passage, it's awful, all of the things that take place. And just the repeated, the amount of times that you're told that Saul was dead, that his sword took his life and he died, and that all of his men had died, just dead, dead, died, dead. It's all the way through. They have fallen on Mount Gilboa. And then you get the awful picture of what the Philistines do. They come and strip the dead and they find Saul and they cut off his head. And then they mount his head along with the three sons' heads onto the wall there at Betshan. It's a picture in all of that that the Philistines have been victorious, but not just them. It's that their gods win and Yahweh, the God of Israel, well, he's been defeated. We've taken out his king, so we've taken out their God. And yet that won't be the end of this story. And in fact, uh, we see something of the valor in the last part of this chapter, in verses 11 through to the end, when the men of Jabesh Gilead come and take Saul's body and bury it and his sons as well and, uh, and, and burn it and deal with it appropriately. And in all of this, then the story finishes and it's a tragic end, isn't it? During the time that we've spent, as we've moved through 1 Samuel, I've often returned and reflected a bit with Dale Ralph Davis in his a little commentary that he writes. And when he finishes this commentary, he ends it this way. He says, the picture is hardly sunny. Leadership annihilated, territory evacuated. Some fled, others couldn't. Their bodies littered the slopes of Gilboa. It is a sad sight. Israel scattered like sheep without a shepherd. In fact, 1 Samuel is simply a sad book of one disappointment after another. The judgment on ungodly leadership, Hophni and Phinehas in chapters 1 through 4. The rejection of prophetic leadership, the rejection of Samuel, chapter 8 and chapter 12. The disintegration of royal leadership, Saul in chapters 13 all the way to 31. Here is the kingdom of God enduring one failure after another. Yet Yahweh, who looks on the heart has chosen a shepherd for these scattered sheep. Presently, nothing looks quite so dismal as Gilboa, but then it's not what man sees. It's dot, dot, dot. And that's really where we finish. That here is the one that comes who looks not at the external appearances, but looks to the heart of the matter. And as we come to the end of this tragically sad story, we come to think about the heart of the matter, the one who is reigning and ruling, the one whose word stands and who makes promises and keeps them. And that's the God that we know, and he's no less true for us today. Let's come before him in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, two chapters that remind us of what devastation can look like. And yet in the midst of it, we see you still at work providentially, powerfully, graciously, 
And we thank you that you are that God, the same today as you were then for David and the God who makes promises who keeps them. A promise that you don't look at the external, but you look at the heart. And so, Heavenly Father, would you look to our hearts this morning as we come before your word, that we wouldn't see you as something that has been vanquished and defeated, some small thing, but a promise-speaking, promise-keeping God who is powerful, in whose providential ways we can walk. And so, Heavenly Father, help us, even at times when we feel that things are overwhelming or have come to a bitter and sad end, that we might look to you as David does at the beginning of this chapter and that in the midst even of our grief, we would find strength in the Lord who is our God. And we know that we can do that because of all that you have done for us in Jesus. So help us look to the one true good shepherd for we are like sheep who have gone astray, scattered, and in need of one who would lead us and love us and restore us. For the Lord is our strength. We ask, Lord, that we would know this in a very real and present way today. In Jesus' name, amen.